Let's get into it then. So let's talk a bit. Obviously, we'll talk a bit about Vitality, then let's just get into LEC. So here's where I'll start here, right? Which is, I've noticed, Alfari, one thing I want to ask you about, because we talked about this on the last episode, is you actually, it's perfect you've joined a team with Perks, mate, because you are in that Perks camp. Where did you notice that the, the second you went to NA, all those fans just were hating on you, even though you won the, you were actually one of the best, at least Perks in it off the games, mate. Like, they used to act like, hey, if you ever won lane and Team Liquid didn't win the game, it must be your fault. Like, you must have just, for some reason, the second the lane phase ends, like, apparently in their world, you just go off to a fucking deck chair somewhere and then do nothing. Me, well, out. When I was watching all the fucking world's games, mate, it was always you going in first and then fucking certain people with Danish accents sort of hiding on the very edge of the outskirts doing a little bit of damage. And then a guy with an American accent ready to join TSM doing no damage whatsoever, slightly outside that island. So it was like almost like a I fucking... I think it was actually the American guy going in first from a lot of the fights that I was watching, but yeah. The bad ones, yes, the bad ones, I agree. No, his weren't actually team fights, so those were just straight hits. But no, basically, yeah, people people sort of like low-key hit on you, Alfari. Like, I think they sort of... I don't know if... Do you think it's like a European going to America thing because I feel like even when you come back to LEC now that's sort of like there's some hold over there people are still sort of like they think you're overrated or something what do you think um I think that's just how like LEC and LCS works where you have narratives and like you have to really force it to make it interesting like this is what casters do they create narratives and I don't know like it's I guess it like came from the me being a very good laner, but this is like because I'm better than other people at laning. This is not because I'm like worse at other things. It's because yes. I'm actually just like strictly better than other people at early game, and knowing how to tell my team how to play around the early game. Um, can I be better mid late? Yes. Can every player? Yes. Is this a weakness relative to my lane phase? That's not narrative. Yes. Got our control. It's, it's 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 relative, right? So relative to my lane phase, of course, because my lane phase is very very good. Um, and then when I'm benched, and I think that actually in our last game at Worlds in the tiebreaker, uh, I, I have like some regrets about this game, but I think otherwise, I think it's like quite, I think, I mean, I, I think it is overblown. Yeah. I don't think I'm a perfect player, but I think that I'm pretty good. Um, if I would criticize myself, I would not be criticizing myself for not being able to influence the map. I think that I actually understand the game very well, mid late, and I talk to my team, and we are like decent. Um, so maybe I'm delusional. It would make sense for me to be delusional, right? Because you have to have confidence in yourself, but sure. I don't think I'm delusional. I think I'm actually just fine. Okay. It's now. I, I, I have a question on that because I think a lot of the, I mean, the way the narrative is formed is people say that you're like the best laner, right? And then they're like, okay, if he's the best laner and he's not winning all games, that means that like there must be issues elsewhere. Uh, when it's top, top lane. Head it's top lane. Not... It's the role, by the way. Like, okay. You, like, like top lane is like, of course, top lane can have influence, right? But it's it's like fucking 10 CS lead top lane compared to like bot or mid having like stronger champions or team fighting better or winning their lanes it doesn't mean anything that's how it is it's like nice right it's nice to win your lane as top lane but if like you make a mistake as a team if you have like wrong map play or if your mid bot or jungle is behind then your lead top lane is going to be it's, it's not going to matter it's like that's that's you know we could do a little tangent on this because actually you know obviously a classic discussion is how strong are the roles relative to each other etc dom right a lot of people would say the last few years top lane's supposed to be one of the most influential roles in the whole game but actually when he's saying that am i even thinking of worlds like at worlds think how many times people picked jace and people are like stuck in a narrative from three years ago with that champion they talk like if you pick jace and you are up in cs it's like you just 1v9 the game. They make it sound like that's like fucking Silver Katarina with nine kills. Like, it's not like it doesn't instant win the game. So anytime you ever win lane on CIA and Jace, I've noticed in the modern day, people act like if you don't totally dominate every team fight, you would just shit in the game. But I'm thinking on Worlds, who the fuck dominated on that champion? Almost no one. Like, even the best Asians weren't picking that and just shitting on everyone in the whole game. Like, almost no one did on that. Like, I feel like that something is off with the narrative with top lane. What do you think on this, Dom? I'm not a specialist to the game. So where do you, where do you come down on this? Um, well, I think, I think it's weird because I feel like each, like Jace is like a different champion in like every single game that you play. So I think the, the biggest issue for me is that like people don't really 
like look at specific games and how Jace interacts and like, is Jace actually just a champion that can 1v9? Does it just completely outrange the enemy team? Can you sit there and poke forever? Like, does the enemy team have hard engage? Do they have flank? Like, I feel like there there's just two general like statements for all these types of champions. And like a lot of times, like Jace won't function like that. Like so sometimes, for example, I'm just seeing Jace as just a counter pick to Gwen, where it's essentially just supposed to keep the Gwen down in lane. Right. But like, it might not be super like synergistic with the comp. Like they might not actually have the ability to outrange. And then sometimes like the rest of the comp could just be insufficient and, and the Jace can not really be that much of a factor throughout the game. So I think that that's just like the way that people have to kind of discuss the game is they're going to discuss it in like isolation. But the game is obviously a lot more complex than that. And I mean, even even myself, when I'm co-streaming, I mean, I'm not going to go into like the specifics of every single situation when I have a guest on and I'm trying to like entertain and like all this this stuff. But I think that people just see the game like way too black and white in general. And Jason and, and top lane is kind of like a microcosm of that. So I guess that would be my take on it. What do you think, Alfari? Um, I, mean, I think top lane actually was like very strong last year, at least for like periods of it. I think in spring it was really broken. When when Acton was really OP, I thought GP was really OP. Now with Stripe Breaker, like all these new items, I think top lane champs abused them really well. And also jungle was like a really good dog role with like Udia. So I thought in spring top lane was really broken. Um, but yeah, when you reach like high levels of competition, obviously as well, it becomes like harder and harder to have influence as well. Like in terms of individual, it becomes more about team play and drafting is also so important. Um, and there were some champions which, when they're in the game, an example of this is Yumi at Worlds. It doesn't matter basically what every other champion the game is doing. If like there's a Yumi in the game, it's all about bot lane. This is like just kind of how it is. You can like make parallels like now as well, like Caitlyn. If Caitlyn's in the game, it doesn't really matter what else is in the game. The game is going to be decided like by the bot lane matchup if both teams are like functional. Um, so. That is just like this. Um, top lane is sometimes really impactful, right? But at in terms of like winning lane by like 10, 15 CS, it doesn't it doesn't determine a ton a lot of the times. By the way, since obviously we're going to get into like this split, etc., I wanted to ask briefly was you were basically like if people don't know, I've alluded to some of this in the last off season, but people, a lot of people don't know the behind the scenes. This is why I have real questions, by the way, about some of those leaker guys who think they have all the connections. None of these stories ever get fucking told, mate. These would be fire tweets to put out, right? There's never been an official version, as far as I know, of if before Perks joined Cloud9, as far as I knew. There was a super team like this with you and him proposed back then, right? Wasn't it like you two were going to hook up and it could have been in Europe, it could have been NA, right? Yeah, uh, we were, there was like a super team. It was, on, it was also with Fatality um, before we both went to NA instead. Um, it was going to be with, Fnat it was going to be with, I was going to say Fnatic, it was going to be with um, Upset and Hillesheim. There you go. Yes. And it was supposed to be with Skeens. Um, and Perks and Upset wanted Trick, which I also thought was like better than Skeens. I mean, I mean Skeens is on the Academy team now. So yeah, actually, sure. Skeens is really good, guys. He's on Fidelity Academy team. He's really good. Um, but I didn't want to play with him at the time. So I was like, you know, and also I'd already made like a verbal agreement to TL and I was pretty happy with TL. I thought Core JJ was, I mean, I thought the roster was really insane. I thought. It's like good chance to win a split, right? Going to an A is like a little bit easier. Um, I think it's like more stable than European teams where there always seems to be like a new European team full of rookies, like an upset. And I just, I just really want to win a split. That's like my one goal. Like, I mean, obviously I want to win Worlds too, but like yeah, of course. I've been playing for, I don't know, six years in LEC, LCS, and I haven't won a split yet. So for me, it's like one step at a time. I want to win a split. So that's like was part of the reasoning. But yeah, there was like potential uh, like high chance to make like a team with perks last year as well. Yep, sounds good. I mean, on on the the questions that we had earlier about like you and your yourself as a player, I know you said yeah, you're not delusional, but do you think that there's things like not regarding to yourself, but maybe how you behave in a in a team? Like, do you think you maybe like trust your teammates so much? Because I think what a lot of people see and what the casters will see is like there'll be a game where you know, your team will be behind and you'll go for like a TP play and it will just, it will just result in nothing. And then pretty much like your lead will be less, lesser as a result uh, of this play. Do you think that, that 
that has any merit. Like maybe you you listen to team calls or people will ask for a TP and you're not strict enough about telling you your team when you can TP, when you can't, like all that type of stuff. Or do you think that there's just like, or do you think that that's uh, kind of overrated? So like if you could, if, you, if I could give you an example, those, I think a game in week one, I'm not sure like how much you Excel. value week one. Yeah, yeah, Excel. yeah. yeah. I think it was like the Wukong game where you had a huge yeah, yeah. lead. You were like solo this, killing. This, this game, I felt like I should carry. Yeah, I agree. I think I played badly this game when I was ahead. But yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I don't think that was anyone's fault apart from mine. Um, I also didn't practice with the team for like the whole time. I was uh, mm -hmm. had COVID, so I was like chilling in my apartment, being a little bit ill, playing from the apartment, even for LEC when everyone else was at the office. But I was really far ahead and my champion was strong. The rest of the enemy team was ahead, but I was so far ahead that if I played better, if I made better decisions, then we would probably win. But we were also overforcing too much, so it's like, you know, they are both, but I take responsibility for that. I don't think it's like think listening I, to calls too much, it's just I made mistakes. I think I think that these are the games that like drive narratives. So people will see that one game, and then if like there's no TP situations that like you're going to you know, have to execute for the next four games, then that's just going to be the narrative. It's like, oh, Fari's good in lane, but he sucks at using TP, you know, until there'll be like a stretch. And and the thing is like the first thing that people will see will always stick more than like, if you do it right, it's like, you have to do it right, like eight times in a row. And then people will be like, oh, well maybe that first one was actually a fluke. So at least that's my interpretation of like how the community starts like writing these narratives. I mean, it's just regular season as well. Like there will always be like stupid narratives in regular season to keep it interesting. And because best of ones are like so uh, volatile, the package changes so often, teams have like limited practice, it's kind of like, it's, it's not exactly a flip who wins, but a lot of it is, you know, any, any team can beat any team. I mean, you saw Astralis beat Rogue, right? It's, is Astralis a better team than Rogue? No, but any team can beat any team. Any player can play badly. I know that when playoffs comes, the now is going to be that we are shitting on everybody. And then if we play badly, if I'm like making wrong TPs, if we are trolling with draft, if something like this, then, then yeah, then I'm a bad player then, right? If we make mistakes in playoffs, then it actually really matters. But otherwise... Well, will it be that you guys are like shitting so on everyone in scrims, but you're not currently in the playoffs? Or will you be in playoffs shitting on everyone on stage? That's my question. Yeah, we'll be in playoffs. Come on, Dom. What kind of question okay. is this? All right, I don't know. I mean, the narratives right now, Mad Lions and, and you, it's it's over for you guys. I mean, what? There's only what seven games left, something like that. Like, who knows? Anything can happen. I, I hear XL is the real deal now. So, XL are not like bad. They're like better than they should be, I think. But they have um, their players are stepping up. Yeah, the mm -hmm. XL are yeah, not bad. Yeah, I'd also, be I will just say there. to be fair, Vitality still have to have yet to play in the second round robin. SK Gaming, BDS, Astralis. So all I'm saying is, anyone who has those three games still yet to be played, I feel like probably going to be in playoffs. That's my feeling. What do you think on that, though? Because the narrative, obviously, this split of uh, Fari goes like this. It's a, I think it's a mixture of two narratives to me. One is it's like super teams don't work because everyone sees all the big names. But to me, another narrative that is an obvious one suggested, it works with the context of super teams, is I think the reason super teams also are tricky is a true super team isn't supposed to be like you keep... It's like you're not supposed to just keep like three or four players and add one or two really good players. That's not really a super team. A super team is like you make it like the Avengers out of nothing into something, you know. So the problem with that sort of team always is there's no core. You start from scratch, right? I mean, in your case, like these are all players that are brand new to you. So how would you say, like obviously the split began so badly. What would you say to this whole angle where people looked and at the beginning they were like, this team's looked amazing on paper, but what is it in the server? Um, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a totally new team, right? Compared to teams like Rogue or um Fnatic where they have like the bot lane and stuff like this so we are very talented players I, I i believe this i think that actually we have like some of the best players in our position in europe um but we have different styles we're working with different teams and you know it's same for any team i i feel like always regular season is just like training grounds it's just you're just like learning how to play during regular season and like the stage games are just like, of course, yes, you want to win them and they're like, it's, it's good to win them and you're supposed to, but it's all practice and preparation for playoffs. Of course, some, only like six teams can make playoffs, but like, how, like, how unlikely is it to like not make playoffs? Of course, I've missed playoffs a few times, so I know it's, you know, anything can happen, but, um, 
yeah, I think that teams take time to grow. And of course, like a team like this is not going to reach its full potential until I don't know exactly. Maybe like I I I want to be optimistic and say like by the end of spring, right? For like for like playoffs in spring, but realistically probably I mean I think internationally is when a team reaches their peak actually. So probably internationally is when it's like a team is like final form. But we are still growing, we're still getting better. I'm not like worried and I still consider us to be a super team, but we'll just see in playoffs, right? Playoffs is all that matters. It's the first stage of Copium. First, it's regular season doesn't really matter. Then it's Watch. spring split doesn't really matter. And then if you don't make Worlds, it's like, oh, we were just focusing too hard on what we did at Worlds. It's literally yes. G2 all over again. I'm, yeah. I'm seeing it right in front of our eyes, Thorne. I did like that, by the way, when they genuinely, like, like they didn't even do it like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. They genuinely came on talk shows and were like, I think our problem that year in 2019, the best year ever for a Western team, was we put too much focus on winning MSI. This time around, we're not going to, like, what are you talking about, you idiot? <laughs> like, you are aware it's like almost impossible to even win that. Like, you don't choose it. It's not like you woke up and you were like, they, they made it it sound like D and D, and they just put too many points in the fucking middle season tournament, and they have none left for worlds. Like, what are you talking about? Like, if you're the best team, you just win all the tournaments, you idiots. Like, listen, I get what they were trying to go for, which is like, you know, pace yourself. By the way, you do notice this is how you know he's in a fucking perks team already. He's already on that vibe of like, you know, it's regular nice if you season. win the best of one regular <laughs> season games, but what really are they though? Because perks' whole shit's obviously just like fucking positive. Which finger will I put the last ring on? Like, like he's on some shit like that, isn't he? So <laughs> that's the thing though, Alfari, right? If I were you though, on the one hand, you could feel really confident you play with the greatest winner in Western League of Legends. On the other hand, he's also won everything, mate. So is he actually is perks here to is perks super driven, do you think? Where's he at in his head at the moment? Where's he at in his career? Um, I mean, I can't compare because I haven't played with him before, That's true. but uh, I'm sure he's still a competitor. I think he's still trying very hard. Um, I don't think you get this far and you win as much as you have being him unless you have like this strong desire to win and keep winning. Like it's like, OK, like sometimes you like win once and maybe you lose motivation, right? But he just keeps winning, keeps winning. Um, and that's the reason I wanted to play with him, actually, because I figured there's something special about him. He has beaten me in the finals three times now, I think, maybe even more, but he's, he's beaten me a lot. And, you know, I figured, fuck it, maybe, maybe I can win with him. So I think he's still very competitive. I think, yeah, he, he will always be like that, I assume. Dude, I didn't even thought of that, Dom. I didn't. I actually hadn't even my brain put that angle together. You remember in Alfari's mind, he also went over to LCS and Perks was beating him. Then he was like, "I better fucking <laughs> play with this guy Christ, already. Like, give me a break! Like, what, what is this? Up. Do I ever get? I know it's fucked up. Isn't it? That's why he just got the fucking. He's he's just inside Alfari's <laughs> head now. So he's like, "Look, unless I want to fucking lose to the guy, I better just be on his team, Adna. There we go. Pretty Fuck. much. Yeah. He's having fucking nightmares of like the game four spring split, like Zoe yes. bubble just coming through and just like winning the whole fucking game. It's like, shit, I need to play with this fucking guy. Indeed. Want to see more cool, funny, interesting clips based on topics from my content? Well, subscribe to this channel then, or, you know, be a pleb and don't.